Okay, now before we leave chapter 15, I said we had to talk about verse 6. And in order to talk about verse 6, we have to talk about the New Testament. So I want you to hold your hand in chapter 15, verse 6, and I want you to turn to Romans 3, the end of Romans 3, the beginning of Romans 4. Now, um, Paul is trying to do something in Romans. He's trying to demonstrate what God's righteousness truly is, how God can forgive us even though God is righteous and we are unrighteous, and how we can participate in God's righteousness and receive God's righteousness. And, he ha and he's also trying to do a couple of other things while he does that. One thing he's trying to do is he's trying to prove that God's righteousness is also available to the Gentiles. God's forgiveness, God's mercy, God's salvation, and God's righteousness is not something that only belongs to the Jew. It's something that also belongs to the Gentile. And then while he's doing that, and in order to do that, he's got to prove something else. He's got to prove that this is not a new idea. This is not something he's making up. This is not something he thought of on his own, but this was a reality which was being taught in God's Word all along, that this was a part of God's plan all along. And I'm basically going to make some points along those lines that Paul did not make. I'm going to expand his argument a little bit. The great first Jew, the patriarch, which means first father, is Abraham. He was the one that the Jews looked to as the father of the race. He was the head of the family. He was the faithful one over the family. Well, how did you become a Jew? Well, one thing you had to do is you had to be circumcised. If you weren't circumcised, then you uh, were not a part of the covenant. As a matter of fact, Genesis 17, where we first see circumcision introduced, says that if a, a, a man would not be circumcised, he had to be cast out from among the people. So, Paul is considering this, this business of righteousness and, and faith and how we're made right with God. He says in Romans uh, 3.23 that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In verse 24, he speaks of justification. Justification is basically salvation. Justification is when an unjust person, a sinner, is declared just by God's own decree, God's own decision. And he, Paul says that being justified as a gift by His grace, in other words, salvation, justification, is not something we earn. It's given us to us by God as a gift through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Christ takes the penalty for our unrighteousness on the cross. We take the reward of His righteousness in heaven. He spends a terrible six hours of darkness on the cross that we can spend a wonderful eternity with God in heaven because of His sacrifice. Paul writes in verse 25 that God showed this way that He was satisfied. The technical word is propitiated. That He shows this propitiation which Christ brings in His blood through faith that God looks on the blood of Christ and he's, he's satisfied to demonstrate His righteousness, that is, God's righteousness. And that He passes over the sins that had been committed before. He forgives them because of Christ's righteousness and Christ's sacrifice. Now, this is what he's teaching at the end of chapter 3. At the beginning of chapter 4, he proves that this is the way the great men in the Old Testament were saved. In other words, it's not that the Jews in the Old Testament were saved by works and their own righteousness. 
with the Jews in the New Testament or the Gentiles in the New Testament or the believers in the New Testament are saved a different way. They're saved by grace through faith. They're saved by trusting in Christ's righteousness. What Paul is proving is, no, it doesn't work that way. Even those who were saved in the Old Testament are also saved by grace through faith. And here's the way he proves it. He asked the question in chapter 4, verse 1, what about Abraham? How was he saved? How was he made right with God? What then will we sh shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to our flesh, that is our physical ancestor, we are his physical descendants, that's what he means by according to the flesh. What did he find out? What did he discover about God's salvation? What did he discover about God's righteousness? Paul says in verse 2, if Abraham was justified by works, that is, if he was saved by his own efforts and his own righteousness, he has something to boast about. Then he said, but not before God. That's not the way it works before God. Then he says, what does the Scripture say? So, in Romans 4 verse 3, Paul quotes Genesis 15, 6. Romans 4, 3 says this, what does the Scripture say? What does the Scripture say in Genesis 15? Here's what it says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him, it was reckoned to him as righteousness. In other words, by the time he believed God, he was a saved man. And we know that that happened at least as early as Genesis 15, 6. Now, here's the thing. Um, Paul asked the question in verse 9, so who did this blessing come to, this blessing of justification, this blessing of salvation? Did it come to a circumcised man? Did it come to a man who was keeping the Jewish law? This is the question Paul asked in Romans 4.9. Is this blessing upon the circumcised or upon the uncircumcised? For we say faith was reckoned to Abraham as righteousness. There he quotes Genesis 15, 6 again. How then was, he rec was it reckoned? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. Because he received the sign of circumcision later. Here's what Paul was saying. Abraham... Abram was saved at least by Genesis 15, but he wasn't circumcised until Genesis 17. So Paul is saying circumcision, becoming a Jew, is not necessary for salvation. Faith is necessary for salvation. Now he goes on to make the same argument with David because he quotes from Psalm 32 in verse 7. And he shows that David was also appealing not for salvation based on his own righteousness, but he was appealing for forgiveness based on his unrighteousness. So here's Paul's argument in the book of Romans, chapters 3 and 4. He's saying, look, if the greatest heroes of our faith, the first father and the greatest king, if they couldn't depend on their righteousness to be saved, how can we depend on our righteousness to be saved? In other words, if Abraham could only be saved by faith, and if David could only be saved by crying out for forgiveness and asking God not to regard his sins, then what are our options? Isn't it true that we can only be saved that way as well? Now, there's something else here that... that um, that Paul does not mention. But the Jews who knew the New Testament would think of this, and I'm going to go ahead and mention it. Remember, Paul is doing three things. He's showing that salvation is by faith, not by works. He's showing that this is not something new, it's not something he's inventing, but that it happened, it was true in the, in the Old Testament. And he's also showing, thirdly, that this salvation is available for the Gentiles and not just the Jews. So he proves that this was taught in the Old Testament by giving examples from Abraham in Genesis 15 and David in 
Psalm 32. Abraham is the best. He's the best in the family. David is the best. He's the best in the government. He's the best in the army. He's the king and he's the general. He's the greatest king. He's the greatest fighter. Abraham is the greatest father. David is the greatest fighter. But what happened in their lives? What did they do? Well, the greatest father took his wife and left her with a Gentile king. And the greatest fighter took the wife of one of his soldiers and treated her like his own wife and then killed her husband. Now notice the connection to the Gentiles and notice the connection between the two sins. Abraham took his wife and left her in the harem, the tent of a Gentile king. But the Gentile was so righteous that he did not touch her and he gave her back. The Gentile was more righteous than the Jew's greatest father, the greatest patriarch. David took the wife of a Gentile, Uriah, into his own bed. So the, the wife of the Gentile was taken in to the harem of the Jewish king. The Jewish king did touch her, and then he killed. He did to Uriah what Abram was trying to avoid being done to him. Abram was not killed by the, Jewish, by the Gentile king. Uriah was killed by the Jewish king. You see the way that the two sins are connected. And you also see that in both cases, the Gentile was more godly than the two greatest Jews in the world of that generation. Do you see what Paul is proving? He's proving that the Gentiles, even if you left it with righteousness, the Gentiles would have a claim. If you leave it with faith, the Gentiles certainly have a claim. We can't please God with our own righteousness. How could God bless Abram because of his own righteousness after what he did to Sarah? How could God bless David because of his own righteousness after what he did to Bathsheba and her husband Uriah? So the only way we can please God, the only way we can be accepted by God is through faith in the righteousness of another. Not our righteousness, but God's righteousness in Christ. So again, we look at these passages in the Old Testament, Genesis 14, and we see the great connection they have, the case of Melchizedek, with the priesthood of Jesus. We look at a passage like chapter 15, and we see the connection with our salvation in the New Testament. We strive to serve the contemporary Christian community with a variety of Christian educational and evangelistic resources. To see TVS Seminary's database, please visit tvsseminary.com.